Okay, great. So I'll just say a few words. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Issa Hanna. I'm a partner here at Eversheds. Uh, we're hosting this event today. Uh, it's my honor uh, uh, to welcome the Institute, uh, Knut, and our uh, distinguished uh, guest here, Arthur Libby, uh, who's going to be honored later tonight. Uh, but I don't really, um, I guess, uh, without further ado, I, I might just hand it over to Knut, but I just want to say it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, oh, just one on, one on the world on behalf of Michael Koppler, who I see Michael on the line. Uh, Michael uh, sends his regrets that he couldn't be here today. Unfortunately, he's dealing with a little case of COVID. For, fortunately, it's uh, it's working its its way, uh, you know, through, and, and he's on the mend. But uh, he couldn't make it uh, to the event in person today, so I'm stepping in. But um, but happy to be hosting. Happy to be um, uh, you know here today. And and uh, with that, Knut, can I just hand it over to you? Great. Thank you, Issa. Thank. You. We've got the final two panels of fiduciary September. Over the last three weeks, we've had, and with today we'll have had 30 speakers uh, speaking on a, an array of topics. And um, in key respects, this is a excellent way to sort of, to bring this year's fiduciary September to a close. Today, in the in our first panel, um, we'll have. Um, Myself and um, Phyllis Borzi, uh, who needs no introduction, um, and um, but, 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 uh, where did he go? He he, he's dis right there. he disappeared. No, James Tierney. He's he's waving. He's waving. <laughs> Sorry, James. James Tierney, who is at the New York airport instead of in the room in downtown Manhattan. Excuse me, Midtown Manhattan. So thank you for being able to join, James. To, uh, today on this first panel, we will discuss a topic, uh, the state of fiduciary advice in 2022. Um, knowing what the what the other two speakers are going to say, you're going to hear three very sort of different different perspectives on where we are today. Um, I have sort of broken a, a, a rule of my own here a little bit and to offer one slide or one Quasi slide that um, Javier is going to put up right now to um, to sort of uh, illustrate how I am looking at the state of fiduciary in 2022. Um, in seventh grade, Mr. Edwards taught our class about the Revolutionary War. You're wondering, he must have the wrong set of notes for this one. He taught us dates. He taught us dates from 1763 specifically to 1783. I don't certainly recall all the other dates that were there in the middle, but here's what I do recall. It's a lesson about how to teach history, and that is the connection and the interconnection of events and, uh, and uh, programs that tell a story. And this is how I'm thinking is an apt way to tell the story from uh, the perspective of where we are with the fiduciary advice in 2022. The state of advice in 2022 is, is best understood by telling a story. I have a, I have a chronology. Are we on? We have a chronology um, starting in, in 2007 and going through August of 2022. Um, it's based on facts and it's based on what I think are key statements uh, from uh, particularly from regulators um, th that during this time. I don't suggest that my list is exhausted. What I do su suggest is that uh, it um, that the list highlights key points that I think do a good job of explaining uh, where we are today and why we are where we are. In one my in my one page summary, which may come up sometime, um, what I've done is I've done something I haven't done before. A friend of mine suggested that I should should use more color in my presentations. Uh, my friend is not from the financial services industry, as you might already guess. She is she is an artist. She's a professional artist and she teaches art. And so um, it is from that perspective that. Um, I've taken her suggestion to heart and color coded this um, document um, in three colors, green, yellow, and red 
to signify what we associate with green, yellow, and red. And as you will look down the page, um, you will see that uh, at the top of the page, we have uh, several green colors. And then as in the middle of the page, we have several yellow colors. And then towards the end, we have um, red colors. And uh, what I want to do is to uh, just uh, quickly highlight, and I'm only going to take the next five or six minutes, uh, these key dates and suggest uh, what, to, what they mean and um, why they are colored, coded as they are. So we started 2007, and as um, many people in this call will know why 2007 is such an important date, and I'm not going to call on you skip, but uh, that in March of that year, of course, the uh, FPA won a, uh, uh, a lawsuit, a key lawsuit against the SEC uh, regarding the quote-unquote Merrill Lynch rule. Um, and that was t absolutely green. Then, uh, then I jumped to 2009, and I, um, um, I focus on the Treasury Department paper that came out that started this last round of, of discussion about fiduciary. Um, and, but then I also focus on uh, the day after the uh, Treasury Department paper came out, uh, the, the, chairman, the chairman of the SEC, Mary Shapiro, ran up to New York, where we are right now, and she gave a speech about how wonderful she thought the the um, the fiduciary standard is, and uh, then she said, "And I don't know. Uh, tell me whether that's legible. And if it's not legible, then we'll take it down. But um, um, I'm, I'm hoping in some fashion it can be legible." Um, she um, she said, "Oh, by the way, there's not such a big difference between um, the um, uh, broker dealers and." Um, and investment advisors. And she used an interesting term. She talked about the indistinguishability between the two. So I have called it the doctrine of relative indistinguishability that has pretty much driven what we've seen coming since then, I believe, since the, since the, uh, from the SEC. Um, and and that, is, that to me uh, deserves a yellow color. It's a cautionary note and um, um, should be remembered as we go through uh, a couple, several events since then. Then, of course, in 2010, Dot Frank was enacted, um, and now I'm going to jump to October 2012 because this is a date that is also over overlooked, or I think usually overlooked, and that's the date that a that a uh, a senior staffer from the from the SEC gave a speech about conflicts of interest, and of course that was uh, Carlos De, De Florio. Uh, now he's gone on and. Um, uh, doing all sorts of uh, uh, larger things in the world of compliance, but he, what he did in that speech, which is which should be remembered, is he said he referred to conflicts as viruses that a that are a mortal threat to the body. Um, think about that terminology and think about uh, uh, where we've come since then. Um, so uh, that I, I call I call that a green. But then I then as we go go further on into the next several years. Um, we see uh, comments from, uh, for example, in September 2014, and I think this is to give credit, this, is, this was a TD Ameritrade conference where uh, the Commissioner Paredes and uh, I am uh, Deputy Director Bob Plays talked about the difference between fiduciary and suitability, um, at, according to Dodd Frank, and said it was two to three percent. And I sort of remember when that was said publicly, and I sort of remember hearing gasps in the room. Um, but I think that was also a, a key uh, a key moment that uh, that should be remembered, um, be, uh, in in part because um, then we have. And I w went back to the files, and and there is our, our Frankel fiduciary honoree. Uh, Arthur Laby in the New York Times just a few months later, in fact, or exact, actually a year later, and uh, he talks about brokerage customers in a, in a certain sense deceived. And that was very strong language then. I think it's even stronger language now to talk about um, the, uh, the idea that was what was being promoted from the industry is that, uh, uh, that they're, uh, they work in their clients' customers' best interest. And, uh, and Professor Laby, I think, gave a very pertinent comment on that. And then as a contrast, again, here we have a, here we have talk about attention. 
Then just a year later, you've got the SEC current chair then, uh, White, talking about um, her approach, her thinking about regulation of brokers and advisors. And her, and her quote is, uh, is, is actually quite fabulous. She says, you have to think long and hard before you regulate differently, essentially identical conduct. So here we have here again, the notion that we're talking about identical conduct. And I think that uh, tells us a lot about what we have since found out about Reg BI and what has happened subsequent to then. Um, and um, so uh, then I jump to um, uh, April 2018 and give it a give it a flashing yellow sign in terms of Reg BI. And then uh, June 2019, um, with the final rule and the final interpretation and form CRS, and I also give it a um, a, uh, a uh, strong red color, um, and then a strong red color in a positive way. And I think this may be miscoded. And if if anybody has an opinion on this, please share it. In November of last year, uh, NASA, the North American State uh, uh, Administration. Securities administrators, thank you, Professor, uh, came out with a great report in terms of measuring Reg BI. And basically, they said in no uncertain terms, nah, nothing's changed very much after almost two years. And so um, uh, that uh, that is an excellent report, uh, I think, in terms of giving us a barometer where we are. So all this to come to come to mean that um, uh, where we are in 2022, finally, we need to look at three events in the last six months that sort of put the frosting on the cake that has been in, in that has been uh, being developed since 2009 and the frosting on the cake is three decisions by the current SEC the first one being in March of this year where they have essentially banned the word fiduciary from form CRS the second one was in June where they came out with their first quote unquote big enforcement action um, and the third one is just most recently in August, where they talk, came out with the guidance on conflicts of interest. Two final points, and then I'll hand the mic over to uh, Phyllis Borzi. What this should be is a great lesson in uh, how how rules can fundamentally change without uh, focusing on the rulemaking itself. The change that we have seen has been a has a, been a demonstration of the power of language, of legalese of lack of clarity and in many cases obfuscation that shaped the norms, shaped the expectations, and I believe actually shaped the rules themselves in, um, in an effort to basically minimize fiduciary duties and or in some ways to eliminate them. I don't know how anybody can, I'd like to have somebody argue, tell me that once you have uh, uh, prohibited the word on a very important disclosure that we're not sort of trying to eliminate the, the word and concept itself. Finally, I think the best uh, best example of this power is to see what the meaning, how the meaning of conflicts of interest have changed over 10 years. Think of uh, Carlos's statement of just 10 years ago, and then think about what is being represented in that conflict of uh, interest um, uh, guidance of one month ago, and unfortunately also reflected in, by the CFP board. And that is the conflict of interest no longer means what the founders and the framers of the 40 Act said, or what even Chairman Levitt meant with through the Tully Commission. The point of the Tully Commission in large part, and if I've got this wrong, I'm sure someone will point it out to me, was to see how we can move commission compensation away from the broker dealers because what? Because they represented a conflict of interest. That was the major point. But today that's gone. And today the new definition is if you if you have if you do anything that in any way can increase your revenue, you have a conflict of interest. And I wish there'd be more focus on that because that is a fundamental uh, redefinition that that explains in large part why the SEC can proudly say in their mind that uh, and look at form CRS and you know there's not really a big difference between broker dealers and investment advisors. So on that point, I will pause. I, I will stop and hand the mic over to Phyllis Forsey and the laptop and the laptop. <laughs> and the laptop. Thank you. Thanks, Knut. Let me get that in place. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. 
welcome to all of you who are on uh, on virtually with us and the people that are here in the room. So I'm not going to start as far back as Knut did. I'm going to focus on what sort of the latest things that we can look for in terms of the Department of Labor's um, input into the growing and continuing debate on fiduciary and conflict of interest. So um, as all of you know, the the uh, Obama era conflict of interest rule was issued in 2016. And um, of course, immediately after it was issued, the ink was barely dry. It was challenged in court. And um, even though it was challenged multiple times in multiple courts by multiple judges upheld it, the Fifth Circuit in a two to one decision the court of appeal the fifth circuit court of appeals in 2018 um, struck the rule down vacated it um, and the trump administration which was in power at that point decided that it would decline to appeal that decision um, no one quite understood what was going to go on after that but um, in 2020 uh, just before the end of the trump administration without any public notice and comment, the administration, the department reinstated that 1975 five-part test that you're all very familiar with, I'm sure, and also at the same time issued a new rule dealing with the same topic of conflicts of interest, except this time they issued it in the form, not of a, a formal regulation, but in the form of a prohibited transaction exemption, PTE 2020-02. Um, that rule was scheduled to be effective in February of 2021. Um, and at the same time or shortly thereafter, the department issued a non-enforcement order that said, even though the rule is gonna be in fact effective in, in February of 2021, we will not enforce it until December 30th, December 31st of 2021. When the rule came out, when the new Trump PTE came out, there was a bit of confusion and consternation. While it certainly wasn't as strong in terms of protecting plan participants and investors as the 2016 rule, there was language in the preamble to that PTE and in the PTE itself that really did tighten up some of the most concerning aspects of the five-part test, particularly uh, that you had to give him, uh, investment advice on a regular basis in order to become a fiduciary. And this was of particular interest to the insurance industry, although it was in, of interest to everybody who gave rollover advice. Um, so that was a surprise that it wasn't a surprise necessarily that the Trump administration would put out a new rule uh, because there was a vacuum that had been created by the Fifth Circuit vacating the Obama rule. But the fact that there were elements in this new rule that really did reflect some of the tightening of the concerns that people had uh, had expressed both through the extensive notice and comment uh, period as well as the public hearings. Um, shortly after that, um, the uh, the election was held, and after the inauguration of President Biden in January of 2021, mostly everybody thought what was going to happen is that Trump rule was either going to be in the dustbin of history or at least delayed. Um, to the surprise of everyone, including the people in the consumer community, many of whom were lobbying for it to be delayed at least and, and changed, um, the Biden DOL decided that it was going to let the rule go into effect. And, um, and they honored the non-enforcement policy. At the same time, they made it quite clear that on the regulatory agenda for the upcoming administration uh, was going to be looking 
taking a fresh look at the five-part test that had been codified in the Trump administration and making some alterations to it, all subject to public notice and comment. And in particular, they mentioned, they, they said in public pronouncements and in, in, their, uh, in their guidance announcing that the rule would go forward as proposed, that they were going to take a fresh look at some of the exemptions, particularly PTE 8424, which for those in the audience who are familiar with it is the is the long-standing exemption that applies in the insurance industry. So people in the insurance industry who want to get conflicted compensation going forward can either use 8424 or PTE 2020-02. That's going to be important because the next thing that happened is um, in April of 2021, the DOL issued FAQs to explain, uh, put some flesh on the bones, as several of the DOL speakers said. Now, that was an interesting approach, the flesh on the bones and the, and the FAQs, because if you look carefully at the FAQ language, what you'll see is um, you can see reflected the long-term uh, coordination between the staffs of the SEC and the DOL. Um, I first reached out to Mary Shapiro right after Dodd-Frank was passed at, because at the, de the Department of Labor had been working on its old rule, uh, its original rule, while Dodd-Frank was being considered by Congress. And I asked Mary if she would um, allow her career staff to work with the career staff at the Department of Labor not so that they could come up with a single rule, but to make sure that at the DOL we didn't do anything stupid. By that I mean we didn't want to do anything in our rule that would have had that would have required people to be out of compliance with the securities rules. Um, and that cooperation continues to date. So if you look carefully with that prism at the FAQs, what you'll see is there, particularly in the area of rollovers, the Department of Labor picked up on some of the guidance, the best parts of the guidance that came out from the SEC as part of their Reg DI package. And what they tried to do is give, give more um, context and richness and guidance to people as to how to comply. Now, you know, this is America, it's 2022. And so within a nanosecond of the Trump PTE rule becoming effective, there were lawsuits filed. And there have been two lawsuits, and I'll talk briefly about both of them. And then I'll give you a sense of what I think is coming out in terms of regulations from the DOL. The first lawsuit was filed uh, like two days after the rule was effective. And it was filed by a group called the Federation of Americans for Consumer Choice. And, and this is basically an insurance trade association. It, um, the, in their statement of interest in their lawsuit, they claim to represent independent marketing organizations, insurance agents, and agencies that market fixed insurance annuity products. Um, and then there were a couple of registered insurance agents that were also played. It was the complaint was filed in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Texas, the Dallas Division. Which, for those of you who, you know, are groupies to these lawsuits, you will know is the go-to venue for business organizations and financial services organizations who want to challenge. Um, certainly all the Department of Labor regulations and a lot of the others. Um, it's a friendly venue, very anti-federal government. And so nine times out of 10, that's where you're gonna see the lawsuit filed. And that was filed there. Um, the complaint alleges that the DOL has, and this is a quote, resurrected and repackaged the substance of its vacated 2016 rule in direct violation in contradiction of the Fifth Circuit's decision 
uh, striking down the rule. Uh, and the heart, really the heart of its argument is the DOL's new rule is gonna really harm insurance agents and the members of this organization because it would deny consumers access to annuities and other insurance products by turning insurance salespeople into fiduciaries. And this, it is alleged, would deprive consumers and insurance agents of their right to choose non-fiduciary advisors. Um, and recently, uh, at the end of August, the ACLI filed an amicus brief in support of the plaintiffs. A week later, on uh, September 7th, the DOL filed its answer to this complaint, and it was a, in the form of a motion to dismiss. It asked the court to reject the lawsuit for lack of standing. And in its answer, it alleged that the plant, plaintiffs failed to demonstrate that they were harmed in any way by PTE 2002, since all the complaint contained is opinions about how detrimental it would be on their business and no actual data to show that harm had been uh, incurred so far. It's sort of hard to demonstrate harm when the rule had only been in effect like two days. But anyway, the lawsuit was filed. Um, the department argued that its actions were consistent with the Fifth Circuit decision, that its exemption was a reasonable interpretation of the prior its prior regulations, and that the plaintiffs could still, didn't have to use the new exemption, they could still use the long established PTE 8424 insurance exemption to get conflicted compensation, which actually in a footnote in their brief, they, they admitted that this was still there, but the whole brief acted like it wasn't. The second lawsuit, um, this is a lawsuit that challenged the exemption itself, this first one. The second one uh, lawsuit was filed by the American Securities Association, and it challenged the frequently asked questions. And the basis of its legal challenge was that this was a so-called legislative rule, not an interpretive rule. It wasn't interpreting anything. It was making new law, and therefore it violated the issuance of the FAQs violated the Administrative Procedures Act, which require legislative regulations to go through notice, public notice and comment. This was um, much to everybody's surprise, um, and I actually got a couple of reporters calling and asking me why this was the case. This was not filed in Texas. This actually was filed in the U.S. District Court for the Middle Division of Florida, the Tampa Division, and that's because this trade association is based in Tampa, its principal place of business. Um, so far, well, in addition to a general objection based on violation of the APA, um, the lawsuit, the complaint focuses on two specific questions, um, FAQ 7 and FAQ 11. Now, I'm gonna guess that most of you in the audience do have not committed to memory these two questions. And in fact, neither did I. Um, FAQ 7, um, the complaint there alleges that um, DOL has changed its longstanding policy about rollovers and whether or not the first instance in which an uh, an individual, a financial professional, um, the first instance of contact with a client can be treated as a, must be treated as fiduciary contact. And um, even though the complaint alleges that the department is saying it is, it's always gonna be triggering fiduciary responsibility, that is actually not what the department's FAQ says. It does open the door to instances in which even that first contact uh, with an individual client could be treated as a fiduciary recommendation, but it's based on the facts and circumstances. So if you only have that one-time contact um, and 
you, you don't envision or there doesn't uh, you haven't engaged in a long time relationship, it still is not fiduciary conduct. And the department in several places makes that clear. But that's uh, that's the heart of the, the complaint about FAQ 7. FAQ uh, 15, 15, 11. Um, this says, this the allegation here is, in the PTE itself, um, the, 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 PTE exemption requires disclosure, disclosure in particular in the context of a rollover explanation or rollover recommendation. And the exemption says that the applicant must document the reason for the rollover recommendation being in the client's best interest. And what the department has done in this uh, FAQ is to flesh out that requirement. It has some very specific things that people have to do. Um, and this is being challenged, saying that this is making new law and um, inappropriate. It, the department hasn't filed a response to this lawsuit yet, although I expect it any day now. I assume they'll make the same kind of arguments that they made in their um, motion to dismiss for the first lawsuit. So finally, let's look a little bit at the regulatory agenda. The department had said from day one of the Biden administration that they intend to take a fresh look at the um, the five-part test and, and update some of the PTEs. That rulemaking has been delayed several times, and it now appears on the agency's rulemaking um, with a target date of the last quarter of 2022, which is in December of this year. Um, and that's in the spring regulatory agenda. My guess is that it will be delayed even more. I think the complication here is these lawsuits. I think they're gonna wait to see, this is just my guess, I have no inside information. Um, but if I were still at the department, I'm sure we would be uh, talking about waiting for regulatory activity until we see what the courts do, whether they dismiss these two um, lawsuits. In addition, there's just, if you look at the spring regulatory agenda, they have 18 regulatory projects that they have that are on their agenda to be completed by the end of the year. That's just not happening. It's a resource question. So I think this is going to slip. But what to look for when it finally comes out, I think they've been very clear. You're gonna see some changes in the uh, 1975 fiduciary definition. And by the way, deciding how to tailor new guidance in light of the Fifth Circuit makes their task even more difficult than when I was there and began this project in, in 2009 because now they have to work around the findings of the findings of the Fifth Circuit, which were never challenged by the Trump administration. And I think you're also gonna see um, changes in PTE 84, 24, and what I think you're gonna see is they're, gonna tr they're going to be incorporating the, condition, the impartial conduct conditions, which are in PTE 2020-02, I think you're going to see them built into more exemptions. So I'm going to stop. I've probably gone way over time. Uh, but that's sort of where we are in the Department of Labor. Canute. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you very much. Finally, um, clean up. James, you're on. Um, so uh, thank you all very much. I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Uh, there were some weather delays from my connecting flight from Nebraska this morning. Uh, and, you know, traffic coming in from LaGuardia is really hard. So thanks very much for accommodating me. Just to introduce myself, because probably most of you don't know me, um, I am a law professor at the University of Nebraska College of Law, where I teach and research in the area of regulation of financial advisors. And I tend to focus like a hawk on broker sales practice misconduct, which means I tend to get more of a friendly audience from the fiduciary community. Um, but like uh, like Arthur, um, I'm also an alum of the SEC uh, General Counsel's Office where I worked on 
uh, BDIA issues. So um, in the brief amount of time I have, I, I want to focus on a big picture theme, which is that the, the state of fiduciary advice in 2022 reflects, I think, a deep regulatory unease about how to think about the unfinished business of harmonization, or what uh, Knut described as the, the doctrine of relative indistinguishability. Harmonization, uh, you know, could mean, you know, you bump up uh, the broker-dealer uh, uh, standard of conduct from suitability and bump down investment advisors to some flavor of best interest, or it could be more about, you know, really trying to encourage everything to be in, uh, in more of a fiduciary standard. And one of the, the recent SEC staff guidances that uh, Knut mentioned didn't really strike me as so ground-shattering until, you know, he, he talked about it a few weeks back, and I took a little look Excuse me, I took a closer look, and I think it illustrates the fundamental problem, which is that the that, that agency's regulation of BDIA standards of conduct and related disclosure rules is looking wholly divorced from how retail investors search for, decide between, and use financial advice and management services. Um, you know, I don't want to rehash the, you know, the kind of run up in March 2 in a way, uh, the fiduciary standard that, that Knut uh, talked about. So really briefly, you know, the, the the problem is that fiduciary status is not something that investors are able to effectively select on when they're in the market for financial advice. And the implication here is that this is you know, a bad uh, way to approach, um, you know, financial advisor regulation because you know, fiduciary duties are increasingly important for investors' financial well-being, but the, the SEC isn't giving investors tools to, to really protect themselves. So um, just to, uh, to kind of begin the rest of my remarks, I want to just say a, a brief bit about how people search for financial advice. This is a, a fundamental market problem that animates at least my research on uh, broker dealers and investment advisors. You know, retail investors anyway are like other consumers. We focus, we can't focus on everything, so we focus on a few highly salient attributes in comparing goods or services, and that could be price, quality, or a few other things. And, you know, legal status and, and the existence of a fiduciary relationship in particular might be a metric of quality, but it's typically not salient. It's overlooked. People don't know, either they don't know to look for it or they don't take it into account when they're deciding. When that's the case, it doesn't bear on the decision whether to enter into some contract or choose a substitute. So it also doesn't bear on competition. And if clients don't know about fiduciary status and don't know to think of it as important, if it isn't called to their attention, then it isn't going to be a basis for competition in the market. The cynical view is that this is an aspiration of harmonization. If the BDIA regs from 2019 are kind of meant to flatten essentially the same conduct, then the market in this view shouldn't be encouraged to distinguish that conduct. So, you know, the from my perspective, the state of fiduciary advice in 2022 rests on long-standing uh, misapprehensions by the SEC about how consumers, how retail investors use information. Of course, everyone knows no one reads prospectuses or registration statements, um, but you know they are protected, uh, at least you know, in theory, by the operation of efficient markets. Someone else is maybe looking out for them by transacting. That's not the case in this market. So that's the basis for you know, form CRS disclosure, try and make salient and standardize some of the important attributes of the decision between different kinds of financial advice. But, you know, as, as we've seen in the rollout uh, and implementation of form CRS, it has big deficiencies. Um, less sophisticated retail investors may not understand the nature of the advisory relationship. Um, the, the quality and content of a fiduciary relationship is nebulous even for lawyers, let alone for ordinary retail investors who don't really know even what the word means. Um, and, you know, the the requirements in, well, I'll get to this in a second, but the, the requirements uh, both in, in the form and as it's uh, been kind of elaborated on through staff guidance uses a lot of boilerplate. And as we know about how people read things, that's going to be skipped. It's going to end up being non-salient to them. And so this raises the stakes for how retail investors in particular engage with information they find important and figure out what kind of advice they are looking for. So you mentioned, you know, the December 2021 staff statement, um, lots of info in it about what the SEC expects to see in, in form CRS. But I think 
for our purposes, it's um, you know it's interesting in that it highlights some of the uh, you know the, the staff's concern about you know a, a uniform best interest about applying a uniform best interest standard to uh, uh, you know, broker dealers and investment advisors and prohibiting extraneous disclosures about you know the term fiduciary. And the suggestion in the guidance is that this is supposed to give an incentive to use prescribed language, you know, uh, do an apples to apples comparison rather than uh, have it be marketing material. But I suggest to you, what is form CRS other than marketing, right? Uniformity is valuable in doing those apples to apples comparisons, but ultimately it's a problem of helping people understand what matters to them and doing that may be more valuable, helping people you know, uh, choose between advisors on that salient fiduciary attribute, right? So this circles us back to, to the, the, the core problem I see in this regulatory area, which is solving the problem of, uh, of investor search for advice. You know, uh, uh, we also discussed a little bit the, the March 2022 um, uh, staff board from, uh, from TM, and you know, it has this interesting language in there about, uh, you know, in this, Although the, the rules uh, differ in some respects, in the staff's view, they generally yield substantially similar results in terms of the ultimate responsibilities owed to retail investors. And so, you know, I, I read that and I look at, you know, uh, other guidance and enforcement actions, and I think, does this all rest on a misunderstanding or a misconception about what the term fiduciary means as compared to best interest or some, something maybe worse, like suitability, right? That, that's where I think the gasps came in uh, when, uh, in that discussion of the two to 3% difference between those standards. But to sharpen that, right, is, is, is it a problem of a misunderstanding about fiduciary status or of how clients use labels and status uh, you know, and disclosures in choosing between different kinds of advisory models? And so that's not just a matter of educating retail customers about the meaning and the implications of fiduciary status. That's also a problem of educating regulators about how people engage with the concept of fiduciary status. Um, all right, so that, that's kind of one big picture theme. Um, a couple of related themes are um, about you know, how people are using information. And one of the emerging trends, at least over the last few years, and uh, less so in 2022 than in 2021, but a big way that uh, retail investors use financial advice is through mobile trading or computer-assisted uh, you know, investment. And I think that heightens the regulatory distinctions between apps uh, you know, regulated as BDs or robo-advice or, or other uh, fiduciary apps. And this is an important area of guidance and, and increasingly of you know, examination of enforcement actions. But more to the point, we have several uh, you know, uh, distinct rulemakings on the horizon. I think the RegFlex agenda says November 2022 for both the um, broker-dealer digital engagement practices or gamification uh, rule proposal, as well as a, uh, apparently separate um, uh, investment advisor uh, digital engagement practice rulemaking. And you know there, there are different kinds of risks and trade-offs for these uh, different rulemakings. The, the broker-dealer gamification side has gotten a lot more attention, and I am, uh, you know, worried, cynically worried that it's. Um, and uh, well, uh, I, I see a silver lining in this, which is maybe that uh, it's an opportunity for the SEC to use the broker-dealer gamification rulemaking to push people away from, you know, the. Uh, uh, we're not making me like it's like the Magritte painting. Uh, you know, this is not a pipe, right? This is not a recommendation, uh, and yet they're still pushing uh, you to uh, to do more trading, right? So it might be an opportunity for the SEC to push people away from that model of engaging in markets and toward maybe more fiduciary advisory services to the extent the SEC recognizes that distinction. Right. So the um, the last uh, comment I wanted to just make is about the uh, two other lurking issues that I think are going to be increasingly important in this area in the shape of fiduciary regulation in 2023. One is the big theme in administrative law, uh, the administrative law side of securities law, which is to say um, the, the general kind of flavor of anti-administrativism, which you see in a series of very high profile losses uh, by the 
by the SEC, um, at the, mostly at the Supreme Court, um, and mostly on the enforcement and remedies side. But you know, there, there are other big trends like the, the emerging major questions doctrine issue that uh, we saw in the West Virginia versus EPA case, um, uh, you know, raising the stakes of when Congress is uh, trying to delegate authority to agencies to act on major questions of economic importance, they have to speak with a, a particularly clear statement. And that's relevant for all of the folks in this room because uh, the SEC relies on very open-ended grants of statutory authority in this area. And it may make for uh, grist for legal challenges under the major questions doctrine um, if the SEC kind of tries to uh, get too, uh, too fresh with the rulemaking, uh, at least from the uh, Supreme Court's perspective. Uh, you know, that, that that's important because, you know, Reg BI, uh, if you believe Gary Gensler is maybe here to stay for a little while. Um, and as my colleague and co-author Ben Edwards said, there are limits, uh, you know, I think in, in one of these other panels, there are limits to what the SEC can do just with Reg BI as compared to issuing a new regulation. And if they did do that, uh, that's uh, that's potentially gonna be subject to a lot of litigation. The last thing I'll say in, in uh, 30 seconds is that given all of that, it may be that state securities uh, law is the possible safety valve for some of these um, trends. You know, we saw uh, both the Massachusetts state securities regulators adopting um, you know, uh, heightened fiduciary uh, duty regulations for broker dealers registered there. Um, that rule has been uh, overturned or invalidated by a, a state trial court. It's now on appeal. And it, it's not clear what the state judicial, uh, uh, Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts can do with that, but it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, he, or that uh, uh, Bill Galvin, the um, regulator there, or other state securities regulators shouldn't be trying to extend state fiduciary common law. Even if one court says no, some court, some state court can say yes. So in my view, that's a potentially high value and high priority target of kind of regulatory and policy attention in this area. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there. I know we have a few minutes for question but thanks very much for your time okay great i knew you would at least respond if nobody else did thank you um uh so great to see everybody and um thanks so much for participating in this so james i had one or two uh questions uh for you um and then maybe just one question uh for for the larger group uh just one quick follow-up on your last point about the anti-administrativism and the major questions doctrine um so i i just wanted to see if I can get your quick reaction. You know, the SEC did get authority in Dodd-Frank to harmonize the, the, the duties of, between brokers and advisors. So in some ways, the SEC thought about this. And although I think many folks thought they didn't need that authority, they could have done whatever they wanted to do without that authority, they went ahead and got it in, in Dodd-Frank. And although, as we know, uh, Dodd-Frank didn't require the SEC to do anything, it just required the study, but it did give that, that fairly significant authority to the commission. So I'm just wondering if you've thought at all about that grant of authority and whether you think that might take care of the problem if and when the SEC decides to go back and, and do something further in, in the area. Yeah, great. Um, so uh, I, I totally take that point. Um, as someone who before government service uh, practiced by suing federal regulatory agencies about you know, grants of authority. I mean, I, I take the point, but I'm, uh, I'm, I guess, maybe cynical about what the statutory authority could actually uh, mean in the hands of this particular Supreme Court, because it may be that harmonization, uh, you know, uh, and I, I forget the um, particular uh, text off, offhand, but it may be that uh, the way that uh, Dodd-Frank describes harmonization is what we have, right? It's like a flattening of two business models. And it may be that the Supreme Court is not uh, going to buy an argument that uh, what Congress intended there was for the SEC to just get rid of a non-fiduciary uh, like brokerage uh, practice. So I take your point, it may be uh, on stronger footing than a lot of the other uh, arguments in this area or challenges to other sorts of rules, but uh, I just like don't have a, a whole lot of confidence in the, in the Supreme Court to be on the side of the SEC on this one. Uh, Knu, may I pose one other question to the group? Well, just as long as um, we, we've got members on this group that are very good then, at the speaking. Then why don't I hold off? I've already well, asked one. Okay, no, I, I wanted to get our, our two members of the fourth estate a chance to ask their questions and, and then absolutely come back to it. Perfect. Gentlemen? I have a question for um, Bill Gallagher. Um, so 
list. Um, I was just wondering if you had um, any insights into like specific why to use that best revised or like dealing with with um, with the spectrum that each each one of the other two. Well, um, it's it's um, the Department of Labor, EBSA's typical practice in in terms of compliance is what they really want is compliance. They don't want, uh, it, it isn't a gotcha, you know, let's just smack people with penalties. And so I know they've been doing a lot of public outreach. They've had a lot of meetings with groups and individuals, individual companies that have interest. I, I think probably the biggest set of issues in compliance are around the biggest problem, which is the rollover area and how, to what extent um, are people, what's the level of documentation an advisor needs to demonstrate that a recommendation to roll over is in the client's best interest? And, and that's why I think the second lawsuit is most interesting because it focuses on that question the DOL, before it put out its FAQs, had gotten lots and lots of requests from the industry to give them some more guidance as to what was going to be expected. Um, and so then, of course, when they do it, then it gets challenged. But one thing I don't know that most in the audience know is when the DOL does an investigation, suppose they do an investigation of a, a 401k plan, they have checklists of what the investigators are looking for, and those enforcement checklists are public, and they're on the website, the EBSA website. And I expect that they will, that some of the things that are, that were part of the FAQs will be incorporated in those checklists that the that the uh, uh, investigators use, but I I think the compliance problems, by and large, that I've heard anyway, are people not really knowing what's enough, what kind of documentation is enough. Well, I think that's one of the reasons that I I would think that they would be waiting to uh, issue more guidance to see whether the, what the courts are going to say. I mean, they want to be helpful to the, to the industry and people come in and ask questions and they try to answer them. Um, but if every answer they give is going to result in another lawsuit, that's only counterproductive. Any, any questions? Maybe I might have halfway answered the question I had, which was about lawsuits, just kind of about, you know, with your, Experience kind of taking a look at both lawsuits, which do many of you think has a pretty good chance of, of success in terms of potentially, you know, overruling or, or significantly changing the the, uh, the rules of stands and, you know, how, how much of a chance of success is that? Well, uh, you know, it's hard to it's, tell. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to tell. The, the, the insurance lawsuit challenging the PTE generally, I think the weakness in the lawsuit is um, what the department identified in its brief, is that for people who want to make recommendations and sell insurance products, there there is at least one other existing, long existing PTE that the insurance an insurance agent can use to get conflicted compensation. So it's really hard to demonstrate that you have that you are being injured if the the nub of your argument is I'm worried that I won't be able to sell the products that I always have sold uh, because I don't like I don't either I can't or I don't want to fit in with the conditions and the PTE. So I mean I think that one probably because it's a little farther along and a little bit easier to see the issues. The second lawsuit 
as I mentioned, really turns on this question of what kind, how does one view, how does the court view um, FAQs? They aren't, you know, if you, if I'm not a student of the Administrative Procedures Act, I had to learn more than I ever wanted to know when I was at the Department of Labor, because obviously we didn't want to do anything that would violate the rule. And our rule always was, well, when in doubt, get public notice and comment. Um, I think if you look at the record as a whole, um, there is support for the kinds of, uh, particularly that disclosure part, that like FAQ 11, the, where the disclosure issues are addressed. I think there's support for those kinds of things, but ultimately it's just going to turn on a legal issue, which is the question of whether or not this is a legislative guidance, legislative guidance for interpretation. You know, I want to think that the department will prevail on both, but I really don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, I want to jump in here, and we've got two individuals who are uh, part of our next panel, and uh, you can see that we're all primed to go over uh, over uh, our allotted time, but I want to get a signal from Deborah DeMont and Louise Aguilar that that uh, if we go over a little bit, you'll be all right if, uh, in terms of your speaking uh, in, in the next half hour. Um, so, I'm fine. How was that? Yeah. That's first for, me if I, first for me if I get out of this before midnight. Okay, that, that much I can. That much I can guarantee. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you, you questions from others. Okay, then. then um, uh, do we have any questions from our um, illustrious uh, uh, individuals who are who are uh, tuned in here for any of the panelists or for Arthur Laby? Um, so maybe just one or two uh, quick follow-up questions, but I, I I don't think this will will take too much time. Um, famous last words. So um, uh, uh, James, you know, you said you were talking a bit about the misapprehensions at the SEC about how investors use information. I think Knut uh, uh, talked a little bit about that as well. I mean, I guess the the hundred thousand dollar question is, well, what do we do? Um, uh, and 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 if you found yourself to be SEC chairman or you had the ear of the SEC chairman, uh, wh what would be your what would be your suggestion and recommendation? And I guess that. I would, I guess, marry that with a much broader and more philosophical question um, uh, that takes us down a slightly different uh, road, but I think it's interesting to ponder. Um, so Knut started out and gave us a lot of history, which I thought was very interesting, and uh, 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 Phyllis picked up on that a bit, and James, so did you. Um, and I think we should all remember that when the SEC first started rulemakings in this area, and it was actually back in 1999, and then picked up in 2005, that was all pre- uh, global financial crisis. And the gist of the SEC's rule, uh, which as we know was was vacated, uh, was, was permissive, right? It was certain broker dealers not deemed investment advisors. It was deregulatory and permissive. That was the that was the road the SEC was taking. Fast forward to the financial crisis and then in the Obama White Paper, um, uh, uh, as you all know, we see the trend going completely the other direction, right? It was it was restrictive and, and regulatory. Um, now, ultimately, the SEC didn't act on that, and it was many, many years later, um, 2019, until we finally got Reg BI. Um, but there was that initial legislation that I alluded to earlier, where the SEC was required to do the study and did get enhanced rulemaking authority after the financial crisis. So this really raises the question of wh where does securities regulation come from? What is the impetus? And there is a long school of thought um, that it comes out of crises. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that, um, but there's a lot there. There's a lot of, I think, good good literature that suggests that securities regulation, new laws, new regulations that are uh, transformative come as a result of a crisis. Um, and I guess I'd be interested in in what uh, James, you, but but uh, Knut and Phyllis, I mean, all of you, and certainly others uh, on the call, if you uh, uh, on the Zoom, if you're interested in in talking about this, to to uh, uh, just reflect a little bit on what 
causes securities regulation? Where do we get it? And do we have to wait for the next significant crisis until we see major reforms in the area that we are all speaking about today? Uh, so perhaps uh, I'll, I'll take a, a quick stab at answering that question. I think ultimately the answer is a bit of a political question and maybe a matter of generational turnover. Um, so I'll, I'll return to that in a second. In my view, you know, securities regulation reflects the aspiration that the highest and best use of markets is to promote human flourishing. And at least as it relates to how retail investors uh, you know, relate to broker dealers and investment advisors, uh, if, if the current system is not doing that, then that is a pretty good argument for uh, undertaking major reform, even if there isn't, you know, a crisis. Uh, obviously, never get a crisis, let a crisis go to waste. Um, but, you know, even absent uh, uh, pressing crisis, you know, there's still work to be done. You know, the, I think the generational concern is that young people tend to want uh, cheap uh, execution-only brokerage services, but don't want expensive, conflicted advice. Um, they are happy to get, you know, uh, expensive or even inexpensive, unconflicted fiduciary advice, at least from the evidence I've seen. So, you know, given all of that, uh, there's this question of paternalism. How much do you just tamp down on what people want, which is the ability to trade rather than kind of save for uh, life cycle uh, purposes? And, you know, you ask what I would do. My own uh, view or my own approach would be kind of as a bull in the china shop. So, you know, if I were SEC commissioner or chairman, uh, you know, uh, I would just really, really push, you know, uh, a heightened fiduciary standard for all dealings with retail investors. But, you know, that's politically terrible, according to Matt Levine. No one wants to get rid of free anything, let alone free brokerage. And that's why I'm not a politician and will never be selected to serve on the SEC. Arthur's first part of his first question to me is just dying for a response. And I'll limit myself to a minute. When he, he asked James about the issue of how consumers interpret information and what to do about that. And I know this is going to sound simple. And I know in this day and age, anything that's simple has got to be suspect. But the place, the easy place for the commission to begin is to look at their own research. Their research from 2018 and 2019, where they had the CRS forms reviewed and they came up with some very good recommendations. CFP board was part of that. There was a communications firm part of that. But if you look at what was recommended and you look at what came out, they, the, the SEC rejected them, wholeheartedly rejected these recommendations. So this, this goes back to my theory in terms of this issue of confusion. Uh, it's, it is significantly, not entirely, self-inflicted. And, uh, and, and it is the, the degree to which the SEC has been pounding the table and saying, what do we do? Because investors are confused over this last 12 years. I mean, if it, if it wasn't so awful, it would almost be laughable. But, I, what, but, my, but my point is that if you look at what, what the SEC has done in terms of their own disclosure and how they've rejected their own research, and I mean, literally, the, the, uh, especially if you go back to the roundtables they had, I think, in 2018, and the transcripts are there, I mean, they're just dying to be uh, re-exposed again. Um, again, the point is, you know, this isn't rocket science on that level. And I'll say that at the same time, I'll say, yes, obviously, investors are, are not rational beings. We all get that. But the degree to which they've been, they've been blamed for all this is, is, uh, is indefensible. Anyway, so I'll stop. Any any other um, uh, thoughts from Arthur's questions? You know, let me give it a shot, if you don't mind, Knut, and, and I don't want to take too much time because we're already running over, but this has been a real great panel, and I was standing my joke. Long, I can, Louise, uh, good night's a long way away. Okay, well, if I got any closer, I'd be crawling through the iPad to get to you. Is this any better? This is fine. This okay. is fine. Uh, all right, let me... Uh, just go quickly through some thoughts that, quite frankly, may be more complex with the time allotted. But it's been an absolutely great panel, notwithstanding my my humor at Tampa saying, get me out here before midnight, I could sit here for a long time. It's really been well done. But to, to really take a different tack on Arthur's question about what it takes to have securities regulations made, I guess I'd start off with some premises that, you know, first of all, there's got to be a, a perceived need 
that a rule would uh, would serve. Uh, second, um, uh, you know, you have to acknowledge that the SEC has uh, limited resources and really a lot to do. Uh, some of it pre-programmed, pre -programmed, uh, the changes from chairman to chairman, but also much occurs that are unplanned. It takes uh, time, energy uh, away from what you hope to accomplish. Uh, and third, of course, as uh, Phyllis alluded to, there's the Administrative Procedures Act, which uh, that re you know, requires notice and comment, but requires, quite frankly, it adds time, uh, appropriately so, but it adds time and, um, and, uh, you know, and uh, complexity to trying to get a rule done. Yeah, but all that being said, I think the biggest difference why you see some rules done and others not done, even in a busy commission, is quite frankly the will and whether or not there's a will to get it done. And that usually starts with the chair who has more control over the calendar than other commissioners. But you know, if you get a group of commissioners that really want to get something done, uh, and are, uh, the chairs usually uh, understand that. Uh, and so you know, to me, it's the will. If there's a will to get it done, there's always a way to find the time uh, and the resources to get it done. Um, that sounds simple, I know, but in my, you know, I was there for what, eight years, ended up, I think, being the one of the sixth, seventh longest serving commissioner in history. And, and when I saw all the things that needed to be done, and some got done and some didn't, and sometimes I, I you know, disagreed with the prioritization, but I realized that the difference was that uh, the, the chairman at the time, and I went through four different chairmen, you know, had a particular will to get a particular rule done, and they moved it to the top of the calendar, they re marshaled resources appropriately, and, uh, and basically took it, uh, took it to completion. And you know, not to say that they wouldn't have done more if they had 40-hour you know, days uh, you know, and 100 hour, you know, really long weeks. But anyway, that, that's, that's an answer, Arthur, as to why some things get done and others don't. That's somewhat simplistic, I know. But in my experience, why do we get X done and not Y? There was a will to get X done. And, it, and the particular chairman prioritized that higher than they did others. Thank you, Louise. 